All right. So just, um, you know, as with most organizations, you know, we focus on our mission and our mission at MFHC um, is to champion access for every individual to culturally sensitive quality, sexual and reproductive health education and services. And I always like to say like, that's a real lovely statement. It's quite a mouthful, but like, what does that actually mean we do? And the way that we operate is that we have a programmatic side of the work that we do, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we have an advocacy side of what we do, but that ultimately everything that we are doing within our organization is really to ensure contraceptive equity throughout Missouri. Um, and that we do that by working directly with health centers to improve the quality of services that they provide. And then we work on the legislative and advocacy side, because as you are all very familiar, there are many barriers um, that folks like to put into place legislatively that um, keeps us from fully achieving the mission of culturally sens sensitive quality, sexual and reproductive health education and services. Next slide. So our programs. So as I mentioned, we, we have a very deep programmatic side of the work that we do. We run two main programs. We run a federal program um, and then we run a local foundation program. And that basically what we do is that we administer those programs, um, working directly with health centers that serve specifically um, low income uninsured folks. So um, I think the next slide, Mandy. So we run the Title X Federal Family Planning Program. Um, this is a program that has been around since the 1970s. It was actually um, established under Nixon. It's gone through some changes over the last 40 years, um, but we have been the grantee um, at MFHC, the only grantee in the state for the last 40 years. So what that means is that we apply for the funds um, and luckily have been, um, has been seen as a very qualified entity to receive those funds and then we distribute those funds and work with different health centers across the state. So we establish a network of providers that can actually provide the Title X family planning services. And so what that means is that um, we work with um, a variety of health centers, including health departments, federally qualified health centers, we work with hospital-based clinics, and we work with other standalone um, family planning sites, such as a Planned Parenthood, or even a community action agency, that they do a whole lot of services, but they also do a women's health service program. And so the services that are provided under Title X are a variety of services. The main thing, though, that Title X is known for is to do education and counseling about um, how to prevent a pregnancy, if that is your desire, or how to achieve a pregnancy. Um, and that included in that is any contraceptive services that somebody may need, um, the exams that they may need, cancer screenings, STI testing and treatment, um, and other services like that. And so when somebody comes to a Title X clinic, um, they're guaranteed a certain level of quality. That's what we really per, per, um, excuse me, pride our health centers on across the state is that they are really providing quality, non-judgmental um, services to everybody who seeks them. And that then dependent upon um, their income level and their status, those services range from no cost um, or very low cost for them. And so it's all on a sliding scale. And the unique thing about Title X compared to a lot of other grant programs is that it's not just, um, it, it's the funding that is given to health centers really allows them to pay for um, staffing. It allows them to pay for the infrastructure that is needed um, to provide those services. So it is not, doesn't pigeonhole them into like, it, it really provides the support and the funding that they need to keep their doors open. And without Title X, we know that many of our health centers across the state um, if we didn't have Title X, it would cease to um, provide family planning services because they wouldn't be able to keep their doors open. Unfortunately, we also know that Title X doesn't provide enough funding, and so we still have health centers, even with Title X funding, that still struggle to, um, to be able to expand staff um, to really meet the needs of the communities that they serve. 
Next slide. So the other program that we run is called The Right Time. And this is something that folks may have heard a little bit more about because NCJW is a partner of ours and The Right Time on our community mobilization side. Um, but the, the Right Time is funded by the Missouri Foundation for Health. And it, the premise of it is that everyone should have the opportunity to pursue the future they want, including if, when, and under what circumstances to become pregnant. And so this really is a contraceptive equity initiative. It's a short-term initiative, so we don't expect it to last um, forever and ever, like we hope Title X will, um, that it really is meant um, for that short, short term. It started as a six-year initiative, um, but that due to COVID and just some of the lessons that we have learned along the way, the foundation is actually extending the funding. And so it's going to end up being a nine or 10 year initiative, dependent upon when health centers started. Next slide. And so the initiative really is divided into three main frameworks. We call it the supply side, the demand side, and the environment side. And so the goal is, is to achieve contraceptive equity that basically anybody, um, that, that every individual will know about their options, can have good information about their options, and will be able to access contraception if that is what they choose without any barriers. And so we know that a lot of initiatives like this really focus on what we call the supply side, meaning um, can somebody afford the method of their choice? And so we do a lot of work on that, but we've added two additional frames on the demand and the environment side to make sure that it is really a comprehensive initiative. So the supply side focuses with health centers on really increasing their clinical training. Again, we really pride ourselves um, that no matter what health center um, a patient may walk into, that they're really going to get that high quality, non-judgmental care that's going to explain all their options, that isn't going to unintentionally try to um, bias somebody to one option or another and really focus on the patient as a whole person um, and what is right for them and that the patient um, at the end of the day is making those decisions free of coercion and free of obstacles. Um, we also focus on, because we know a big obstacle for patients is actually being able to afford the method of their choice. Um, with contraception, contraception can range from pretty inexpensive to very expensive. And what we know from research and from our own experience is that sometimes patients are making decisions because they can't afford the option they truly want that would work right for them. And so we remove all those cost barriers. The initiative pays um, directly um, health centers to provide methods at no cost to all patients who need them, whether they be uninsured or underinsured. And so we remove that cost barrier so that patients never have to make that decision of like, I really want you know, an IUD um, or another method, um, but that I can't afford it. So instead, I'm going to take the least um, costly method that I can afford maybe on a monthly basis or whatever it may be. So we remove that barrier for them so that they really are free to make those decisions that um, best meet their needs. We also um, really pride ourselves on that you know, people can switch methods, that they can choose a method, decide that they don't like it for whatever reason, and that they are able, to, they don't feel coerced into sticking with a method that's not working for them based on a cost barrier. And so we're really um, thankful that the foundation has supported this initiative in such a way that allows for that full 100% removal of those cost barriers. The next um, frame that we really work on is what we call the demand. And so this is um, much harder um, because, as we all know, um, here in Missouri, we have a landscape um, and both a political landscape and a cultural landscape that isn't necessarily friendly and open to conversations around sexual health. And so the demand side really is twofold, like it's the marketing of the initiative, just making sure that folks know about the initiative and where they can access services if that is something that they want. But we are trying to go deeper than just that, that marketing and getting people in the doors if that's what um, the service that they are needing um, to really try to 
change that culture shift so that sexual health isn't a taboo issue um, and to make sure that we're really reaching those families in need. Again, that's a much harder lift um, to do a culture shift and to have those conversations, um, but that we really do a lot of that through our outreach and our education and just constantly trying to talk about sexual health as an important aspect of any individual's health um, in order to leave a full um, life. The next um, frame that we work on is what we call the environment. And this is what I am, one of the most things I'm proud about of this initiative is that we really have wrapped in that policy side. A lot of initiatives like this um, don't fully wrap in the policy. And what we know is that this initiative won't be sustainable in the long run after we're after the funding um, sort of ends unless we change policy. Um, one of our biggest policy initiatives, and I hope I'm not stepping on Mandy's presentation, um, and, and this obviously was worked uh, on with uh, you know, partners all over the state, including all of you, was Medicaid expansion. Um, one of the reasons we have to put so much money into the reimbursement side of things is because we have a high uninsured population. So many people are falling through the cracks when it comes to accessing contraceptive services. Um, our goal for sustainability is that everybody would have insurance. And so that then we can really focus on the quality of care somebody receives um, at each health center and ensuring all clinicians are well-trained and are offering full range of options versus focusing on removing the cost barrier because the goal is, is that we have policy in place that there are no longer cost barriers um, across the state. So Mandy will get in much deeper about what some of those policy barriers and solutions are. And then the last is this isn't so much a frame and I often joke that this is not a research project, but it is very much designed as a research project. So we have a partner um, as part of the um, project in Mathematica research. And so they are the evaluators on the project. And so we evaluate everything. <laughs> when I say everything, I mean everything um, in terms of they're super smart in terms of their evaluation, because our goal is to learn from year to year um, so that we can make changes about what's working and what's not working. But that also that if other states are interested in replicating it um, so that we are adding to um, I guess the learnings um, across the country. And so we have a significant amount of evaluation built into the initiative. So next frame. And so this is just a map about where we are um, across the state. So between those two programs, um, we have a total of 85 health centers. Um, of those 85, 29 are health departments. Um, 25 are what we call FQHCs or FQHCs look alike. And when we say FQHC look alike, um, we mean that they offer comprehensive um, primary care and other services besides just family planning services. So they're more like a federally qualified health center, but they don't have that designation. Um, we work with 15 different community action agencies, eight hospital-based clinics, and eight standalone family planning clinics. So you can see, you know, across the state, um, based on the different icons about where we're at, we are not everywhere. Um, we would love to expand um, into more areas. Um, expansion is difficult because in a lot of the areas we are not in, there's not a lot of providers. Um, to, to expand to, or you have health departments that are already stretched beyond belief um, and that they just don't have the staffing to be able to provide additional services. So let's look just a little bit about who we are and what we do overall as an organization. Um, I'm gonna just pause there to see if anyone has any questions and then I'm gonna kick it over to Mandy to talk more in depth about our policy and advocacy. And you can feel free to also ask questions in the chat. I have a quick question. I've been coming across the phrase contraception desert. 
-hmm. lately, um, especially regarding to inequities. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Or is that something, Mandy, you were going to talk about? And I'm jumping. The okay. So a uh, contraception desert, and I don't, um, I know power to the side actually is though they have some research and statistics on it. So I'm not exactly sure how they define it um, in terms of it's basically where can, where can you access and we're really on accessing the full range of methods meaning that sometimes there's health centers that you can go to that maybe you can really only ask access uh, the contraceptive method, the pill. Um, and so we, contraceptive deserts are areas where there is limited to no access of the full range of methods um, from you know, pills, patch, ring, to also the shots or an IUD or an implant. And so we're really looking at increasing, for us, decreasing those deserts by making sure all of our sites are offering those full range of methods that they can offer them same day, meaning people don't have to come back more than once in order to access that method. Um, and that, of course, removing those barriers. We also look at, I think, tied into that contraceptive desert um, analysis is when are the hours open? Like that's such an important thing um, with health centers is that a lot of health centers, and I, I mean, this happens all the time, is that they're open from the hours of eight to four when most people are also working and not able to access care during those times. And so another indicator into re increasing access is do health centers have a variety of hours to actually meet people's um, needs um, according to different schedules? I don't know if that answered your question, Jennifer. I'm actually gonna Google, or not Google, but go to Power to Decide to look up their definition of power of uh, contraceptive de deserts. Other questions? All right, then I'll turn it over to Mandy. I do have a quick question, I, if you can hear me. I'm curious um, for the Right Time Initiative, um, what happens when that funding runs out? Like where are we and how do we, how would you or you know the community get fund more funding? Yeah, that's such a great question. And like, our hope is, is that we've done enough on the policy side and on the system change side within the health centers that they are sustainable. Like some of the system change things that we're working on with health centers is billing insurance practices and clinic efficiency and just things within the health center that make them more sustainable overall. Um, and then, you know, with Medicaid expansion, our hope is, is that then we have drastically reduced the number of uninsured people um, so that cost wouldn't be a barrier even after the initiative ends. We know that it's not going to be 100% that everything just gets to continue um, even after the initiative ends, but that is the goal is that we've really built the foundation and the building blocks through policy changes and through working directly with different system changes within health centers that we, um, that the, the components of the initiative would be able to continue even without funding. Medicaid expansion was key to that. So we know that Medicaid expansion hasn't rolled out in the way that we all would hope. Um, and that, uh, but we hope that it will gain traction and we will see more and more people being enrolled in that. Mandy, I'll turn it over to you. And then of course I will be on later for additional questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you, um, Jen and the whole NCJW team and membership. Um, my name is Mandy Higseth. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Missouri Family Health Council. Um, though it is a difficult act to follow, um, to follow Michelle, um, I will maybe give a different line of sight to the other 
side of our organizational work. Um, and then talk about all of our collaboration and partnership around some of these shared policy priorities and our shared policy agenda. So um, just like the Right Time initiative is still sort of new and kind of newly expanded the scope of Missouri Family Health Council's work, so too is our advocacy kind of division of the organization. Um, we've only just um, started to really dig deep um, and further develop kind of our advocacy agenda as an organization. And um, with the help of my teammate, Tim Williams, who is our outreach and advocacy manager, who is joining us here today, um, we are starting um, now post pandemic um, to really start to, I think, strengthen um, our division's charge and sort of the strategies and the tactics by which we do this work. So generally speaking, our advocacy um, work at MFHC really seeks to increase health equity and access to reproductive and other sexual health and safety net services um, through three kind of components, stakeholder uh, engagement, mobilization, and then a shared policy agenda. And so under those three kind of buckets, um, we really work together through direct grass tops lobbying and other um, relationship buildings that would be with policymakers and move policies on the grass tops level, all the way down to what's happening on the community level, on a grassroots level, educating, mobilizing, and um, inspiring action um, that would influence policy. And so, um, we collaborate and work in partnership with NCJW as a community mobilization partner, as Michelle mentioned. And then we also collaborate with NCJW as a member of the Healthy Families Priorities Coalition that we convene. And so we get the, um, the honor and the privilege. And Jen, I would say this is not hyperbolic to say either that um, NCJW is amongst an exceptional, um, is just an exceptional partner. Um, in all the work that we do. And I will get into some of the specifics here on the next slide. So Missouri Family Health Council's policy priorities for 2022 were kind of laid out before you. Um, Michelle kind of touched on a couple of these and how they relate to either our kind of uh, program work, um, but also how some of the policy pieces really influence that sustainability prong in making contraceptive equity a reality in Missouri. So at the top, um, what used to be expand Medicaid has now sort of transitioned to really a focus on the implementation, the slow going implementation, but also bolstering the enrollment piece. So we and I know others and including NCJW are just still trying to continue promoting the fact that the rules have changed, eligibility criteria is different. Um, and even if folks have not qualified in the past, check again, you may qualify now. You know, 275,000 plus Missourians stand to gain coverage through expanded Medicaid, but something like I believe 14,000 people maybe at most have only um, so far been enrolled. And we know that the state is still working to um, make more efficient um, the enrollment process as the expanded adult population comes aboard. So at the top and kind of, I think it really is core to and baked into sort of all of our health equity and safety net work is Medicaid expansion implementation and enrollment. So that really almost envelopes kind of the rest of, of our policy priorities. So too does racial and LGBTQ equity. Um, so they can kind of bookend, I think, some of the more specifics um, in between. So contraceptive access um, and equity, increasing access is kind of another big element to the proactive side. So if you scroll down a couple, you'll see that there is a defensive piece as well. And, you know, I, I always try to think that it's, uh, you know, we want to be realistic, but also um, acknowledge some of the positives and the opportunities in our policy landscape as well, though there is a significant amount of attacks both to reproductive health rights and justice. Um, there are also um, 
both the last couple of sessions, but also moving into 2022, there are still some opportunities for positive policy developments as well. And chief among them are three things. One is um, annual supply birth control legislation. You'll also hear this be referred to as extended supply or sometimes 13 months. This is uh, a concept that NCJW has been um, a key uh, leader and co-collaborator with us, um, both inside the legislative process, but also outside on thinking through um, how to mobilize and gain traction for this particular piece of legislation. So we know that 22 states plus uh, the uh, Washington DC um, have some policy that increases uh, coverage for contraception beyond the standard one to three months. So we know, you know, most of the time you get a one to three month um, uh, supply of uh, your contraception at a time. But what annual supply would do is require insurance companies that already are providing this coverage or this service um, to cover a full year's worth for that particular individual, limiting barriers, increasing continuity, and also increasing positive public health outcomes in the process. And I should also note, bringing the state up to current public health practice um, in recommendation with the Office of Population Affairs and the CDC. So that is a top um, kind of the proactive list. And we are a privileged partner of NCJW to collaborate on that work. And then kind of secondary, there's just two other concepts just to kind of put out there for everyone to think about. Um, just like there are 22 states in DC that offer extended supply coverage of contraception, 22 states and Washington DC also have some um, increased capacity for pharmacists to uh, dispense, to prescribe and dispense um, self-administered um, hormonal contraception. And so that's another opportunity to increase access for Missourians, as is uh, making uh, emergency contraception more available, especially for um, survivors of sexual assault who present in the emergency room and in other situations. So that is kind of a, a, a three bill suite, if you will, of proactive contraceptive equity legislation that um, we hope to prioritize and see gain some amount of movement or traction in the coming session and coming years. Like we know if Medicaid expansion is, is a good example, we know that people like Michelle and many of you have been working on this issue for the better part of a decade to ensure its passage. And so we know that especially on proactive measures um, under kind of the banner that is often unfortunately stigmatized in public policy and attitudes, we know that it's gonna take a, a consistent effort that would be, um, that would go beyond a single session. And so NCJW um, has led on the annual supply legislation in the past. That bill has unfortunately never been given a hearing, but hopefully crossing our fingers, maybe we'll be able to um, break some new ground in 2022. And then um, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these individually, but as you can see, you know, anything that falls under STI testing and treatment, um, really anything that touches reproductive health rights and justice with kind of an intersectional lens is going to impact the issues we all care about, the services that our programs provide and the work that we're all seeking to do. And so um, on a proactive level, there are a couple of those items, but also depending on what is presented that's putting us in a defensive posture, that is also a component to the in-capital work that we do. So I should also mention that um, NCJW is one of our collaborative partners who participate in the Healthy Families Priorities Coalition that we convene. That work encompasses this shared um, sort of agenda, but also more broadly, we work together on additional issues like improving um, infant maternal health, reducing general barriers to care and strengthening family security. And one example of a healthy families priority that NCJW had leadership on was the VESA um, Act. And so thinking not just about, not just 
narrowly about reproductive health rights and justice, but also we know that a strong family means a strong Missouri. And we think, you know, kind of more um, on a more macro level, all of the different intersections that inform the kind of progressive family um, agenda. And so through that, we look at a couple of additional buckets as well. So what to expect or what's coming? Um, I'm probably not telling you all a lot you don't already know, um, but just to highlight, there is a lot kind of swirling at this time. And it's a really unique time. It's the convergence of a, a number of things that are, are going to result in some really interesting outcomes for law and policy, the extent to which we don't really yet know. Um, so we know that there's going to be continued legislative attacks to Medicaid, um, possibly to funding, but maybe even more so to the enrollment um, component, things maybe like we've seen in the past, like work requirements or other um, tightening of criteria for enrollment um, through the adult expanded population. But then we know that there is also going to be continued legislative attacks on all things reproductive health rights and justice. Um, you know, it's it was quickly uh, it was quickly promised by uh, representatives in the Missouri House that a Texas-like bill similar to that of SB eight would no doubt be introduced, and that um, the goal would be not just to make abortion rarer, but make it in un unthinkable. And so those are expectations that I think we're all probably properly expecting. On the judicial end, there's also a number of other um, rulings and challenges that are swirling around. We are expecting um, a ruling from the Federal Eighth Circuit on um, the a couple of the different components to HB 126, which was, I believe, passed in 2018. You all are quite familiar and probably worked very aggressively on it. Um, I think the court can rule at any time on this. Many are surprised it already hasn't. Um, but in a very unusual move, the court requested a rehearing on this bill by its full court. And that took place at the end of September. Um, and it is essentially litigating a reason ban. That is um, whether or not somebody can seek an abortion procedure on like a Down syndrome diagnosis or certain rationale. Um, so this is a ruling that when it comes down, it could have further impact on Missouri specific access and policy, um, but that's hanging out there. Also, um, as I'm sure we all know, whether Texas challenge, uh, whether either Texas challenge can continue, whether it's the state level challenge um, to providers or the Biden administration's Department of Justice's challenge against Texas based on the SB8 um, situation, the United States Supreme Court is set to um, really can rule. There's no timeline on this. The court can rule at any time. Um, but I think that conventional wisdom is that the court would benefit in issuing a ruling on the, whether those challenges can continue before the Mississippi abortion ban case has its oral arguments quickly coming on December 1st. So I know we're kind of approaching quickly approaching the end of November, but um, the Supreme Court weighing in would be a significant game change and would also have um, implications for what the Eighth Circuit is thinking it might do. And then um, also under the Biden administration, um, a reversion back to a prior Title X rule has been underway um, and has recently gone into effect. What it essentially does is um, pull back Trump era restrictions that limited um, referrals to uh, family planning pro providers who provide abortion services. And also um, it had sort of a rigorous physical separation component that created additional barriers for any abortion providers who also participated in Title X, um, forcing many of them across the country to drop out of the program, which also um, we saw here in Missouri. So there has been a positive development in a new or kind of old, I guess in some ways, Title X rule where those two limitations would be lifted 
But of course, there has been a federal challenge to the new rule um, of which Missouri has also joined as a state party. Um, that suit was recently filed and they are asking the court to move on that um, kind of ASAP, but before the end of the calendar year, if possible, but the court does not have to comply with that. The court can act on the timeline of its choosing, but just know that that's also out there and obviously would impact um, Missouri Family Health Council program services, but also, you know, in the totality of reproductive um, health service access, if the court were to, um, I guess, intervene in an unfavorable way, this would kind of ripple through some of the other services that, that we provide. So a lot swirling in the courts. And then December 1st, as I mentioned, this was a case out of Mississippi. It's a 15 week abortion ban. The United States Supreme Court had accepted to hear this, this case well before SB8 became a reality. And it has been slated um, for oral arguments for uh, some time now. And this is kind of a buildup to what could be um, a change in abortion jurisprudence on a federal level. And so depending on how the court um, rules on the Texas challenge and also how it considers its analysis around the Mississippi ban will no doubt have implications for um, not only abortion, but access to all reproductive um, health services in Missouri and nationally. So it's, it's a bit of a complicated landscape at the current moment, but I think we'll know more in the coming weeks. And then by December 1st, the court will have heard the Mississippi case, and then we will wait and enjoy the Missouri legislative session in the meantime, and then we'll see where some of those other pieces fall. So I know that um, one of the things that people were thinking about was, well, what's at stake? Um, there's a lot at stake right now. There's always a lot at stake when we're talking about fundamental services that have such a significant and impactful, um, have significant and impactful consequences on people's lives, um, especially as it relates to their families and family structures. And so, yeah, I just want to emphasize that there's always a lot at stake, but it is a time and place like none we have seen, especially in the courts, in a very, very long time. And so these will have pretty significant implications, particularly on the Texas challenge. If the court, and it's really difficult for me to imagine this, but if for, for some reason the court doesn't soundly push back against the idea that a state can insulate itself from following um, you know, federal constitutional law, um, that is going to have significant implications for issues well outside of reproductive health rights and justice. And so, um, again, it's difficult for me to imagine how the courts might get there because of the, you know, like years and years and years of deep um, case law that has been created around this. But, um, you know, stranger things, I suppose, have happened. Um, but that could have significant issues beyond the work that we're talking about here today. But there's a lot that you can do about it. Um, the weekly five ways to advocate, which I have typoed on lovely here, um, is one of my favorite emails that I receive. I always learn so much about um, what you all are doing. I love your lunch and learns. I love um, the, co I've done a couple of the coffee talks in the past and you all are such an engaged, active um, group of people. And so you're already seeing a lot of those entry points in your five ways to advocate. Um, is it weekly or is it bi-weekly, Jen? Is it weekly? Okay. Um, and so, yes, I'm sure that during session, those will be perfect entry points for direct action in conversations with legislators and others. And then of course, you're all invited to join MFHC's action network, which is mfhc.org forward slash action. Um, we focus um, on the policy priorities that were mentioned a couple of slides back, but then also with heavy emphasis on kind of the safety net perspective. And so we too um, bring attention to direct action and also just some other features around this work um, and often uh, do things like spotlight partners, which we have done with NCJW in the past. Um, so you are all welcome to join our action network. And then um, social media, like yesterday on Thanks Birth Control Day, um, is a huge platform to not only educate around these issues, but also influence policymakers and also 
uh, mobilize direct action. And so we are on Twitter and Facebook predominantly. We're also on LinkedIn um, and you can find us at the addresses listed here. Um, but I think most importantly, especially going into what is predicted to be a very unsympathetic and difficult legislative session, uh, just continuing to raise your voice and engage your lawmakers remains so critically important. And if you are fortunate to live in a supportive uh, district, to thank and engage your lawmakers in positive ways, because the work that they do is very hard to. And so the solidarity and support, I think, is welcome and appreciated. Um, and if you are not in a particularly friendly um, district, it's still extremely important to. Uh, engage your lawmakers because they work for their constituents. And so um, I always think there's always a point to reaching out and making your positions and your thoughts, ideas, and priorities known. Um, and it is their job to hear them and to consider them in the votes that they cast. And so I don't have to tell any of you this because I know you're all very, very engaged, but it's going to be especially important going into 2022 and an election year to raise our voices even more so and continue engaging our lawmakers for better or for worse. So reach out anytime. Um, I, again, just want to thank NCJW um, for their exceptional partnership and hope that this is, um, that we continue a lot of our collaboration through the next session and beyond. Um, truly, truly, NCJW has been an awesome, awesome partner to work with. So I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen so we can all see one another. And um, questions are welcome to me, to Michelle, or further discussion. Does anyone have any questions? Now's the time. Diana. Diana, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry. I should know that by now. Uh, unless I miss something, which is possible because I did have a distraction during Mandy's talk. Um, uh, we know that there will be challenges that are likely to be coming to not only Medicaid, but to um, Re reproductive rights. Uh, is there anything in addition to what we're all we're already aware of that is going on behind the scenes that we can participate in that will help to um, prepare us for when when this comes, which it most likely will? I mean, I think during the interim is always a good time to reach out to lawmakers where they're able to give you more time and attention than they otherwise would be able to provide during session when things are, you know, more um, fast paced and there's just a high volume of not only to do's, but also constituent interactions. Um, you know, there's a lot of politics at play. So I think that, you know, kind of keeping that in the back of our minds is important. But I think, you know, I, I welcome suggestions and ideas from others, Heather, Jen, Michelle. Um, but I think that before session officially starts in January, there are opportunities for more substantive conversations with lawmakers. Um, Pre-filing of bills begins on December 1st, the same day. Um, as the Mississippi abortion ban will be heard before the US Supreme Court. And so um, that day is fast approaching, but lawmakers are able to give more time and attention between now and when session starts than they probably will be able to to a single issue or kind of um, you know, set of ideas after session begins. And so I think that that's a great place to start, but welcome other suggestions too. Yeah, we've been at NCJW, we've been meeting one on one with legislators over the summer. Um, we actually have a meeting on Monday with Representative Dean, Dean Plocker. So we've been meeting with people from both sides of the aisle. And uh, one of our big focuses has been the I have to get used to talk saying the new term for it instead of 13 month contraception, the what is it the full cover? What is it? Hey, annual supply, yep. annual supply um, of, of birth control. So um, we learning curve there, I apologize. Um, so that, that's been really effective. And we've made some new contacts. I mean, people we've never even 
talked to before. So it's been great. And, you know, you get a nice cup of coffee out of it that we all pay for separately. And, um, and it's, it's really been effective, I think. The other thing that I would, would add is looking forward to November, 2022 is ensuring that we are, um, you know, whether it's organizationally or individually, um, looking at voter mobilization. You know, we are seeing the consequences of elections, um, and we're seeing the consequences of um, the Supreme Court and the lower courts. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, that the way that the system works and that the courts work um, and some of the appointees that are named on courts, it's gonna take a while to undo uh, what has been done. And so anything and everything around mobilizing, um, registering voters, um, et cetera. So both the, you know, the day-to-day -day strategies that many of us are working on um, session to session, but that then also why voter mobilization is gonna be so important, um, not only in 2022, but beyond in order for that long-term strategy if we're ever really gonna try and turn the tide. Other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, um, we will end a few minutes early. Um, thank you again, Michelle and Mandy, so much for this incredibly informative presentation. I, I think that we all have left here with some action steps with a broader knowledge of of everything going on in this realm. So we really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's been so helpful. Um, for those of you who uh, are on, I will be sending out a, an evaluation in a little bit to, because um, we always want to make sure that we're doing the best we can with our lunch and learns. And um, it will literally take two minutes to fill out. So hopefully um, we can get a good response on that. I will send that out as well as um, a recording of the session if you would like to go back and watch it or, you know, little snippets of it. Um, and, you know, again, everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Please join us next month on the third Thursday for our Lunch and Learn with Jacqueline Driscoll, formerly of St. Louis Public Radio, who will be talking about um, her dealings with the justice system when she was um, a survivor of intimate par partner violence and, and, and what we can do to help um, get, fix some things, you know, hopefully. So um, did not articulate that well, I apologize. And again, thank you all so much for coming. Any Any questions that anyone thought of before we wrap up? Well, again, Mandy and Michelle, I cannot thank you enough for your partnership, for everything you do. Um, you have been wonderful to work with. And I think everyone here saw how great you are today. So um, we're really excited to continue our relationship with you and can't wait to tackle uh, the 2022 session with you. So take care, tackle everyone. Tackle we will. Tackle yes. we will. <laughs> yes, we will. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks bye so bye. much.